we all know pretty much who we are, or so we believe. We all have a name, and we have a body that seems to define where we start and where we end. People call us by our name and identify us through our body. Each interaction with our friends, colleagues, parents and partners seems to confirm who we are. Most of us do not question who we are. Our identity gives us a secure base from which to engage with other people, things and the world that surrounds us. But anthropological research shows that it isn't always like this everywhere in the world, for everyone or at every moment. Most children in Madagascar, for example, are born into a particular family, which would in most cases define their identity, or part of their identity, for the rest of their lives. Yet in some cases, these children can pass from the family of their mothers to that of their fathers. Through a kind of adoption ritual, they are able to change their initial identity. Something similar can happen when people get married, not only in Madagascar. According to the cultural settings of the society, a woman or a man can be integrated into the family of their partner. They would change their name, their locale of residence, and sometimes even their entire history of belonging. In Madagascar, it is very important for people to be buried where their ancestors are. It is widely believed that, once a person dies, their spirit remains alive in a world that is usually invisible, yet able to interfere in the daily life of humans. Spirits can help and protect humans in their daily activities. They can provide luck and cure diseases. They can also harm other people by making them sick, bringing them bad luck, and even killing them. The fate and condition of a person alive hence very much depends on the kind of relationships they maintain with such spirits. Once we recognize that our fate and condition depends to a certain degree on others, like the spirits in Madagascar, we can no longer be completely sure as to who we really are. Whether we like it or not, a large part of us depends on our relationships to others. Who we are is therefore not fixed in stone, but very much a fluid thing. Our identity is in part a category of our own mind, assembled and maintained through social relations with family members, friends, foreigners, and mythical heroes and characters, and also with the material objects we collect or cherish, or even consume, like hamburgers or others' favorite dishes, toys, masks, and dolls, places we like to travel to, such as those connected to our ancestry or to nature, and even the deities, gods, and ghosts we coexist with. Many people brought up in Northern Europe and North America like to travel to Antarctica. They say that Antarctica has something magical about it that it is a place where nature can be found in its most pristine form. It is very expensive to travel to Antarctica and also quite challenging. During the journey, many travelers get ill. They say that this is part of the experience, that once they make it through the rough waters separating Antarctica from what they call human civilization, Antarctica offers itself with all its beauty to those who dared to make the trip. Antarctica reveals something deep inside them, many say. A hidden nature that has been buried for thousands of years of civilization, they explain. Once they return home, many feel deeply transformed, recharged, a different or at least renewed being. The magical nature of Antarctica seems to have become part of their selves, giving them strength and power, emancipating them as social persons. Many young people in Siberia, in eastern Russia, do not dream of traveling to Antarctica, 
but to the United States. The work and travel program organized by the government of the United States allows some of them to spend a couple of months as students and temporary workers. Like Antarctica for the Northern European and North American tourists, the United States seems endowed with a kind of magical power for the young Siberians. Most explain that they feel they return as transformed beings. Consuming American food, penetrating American territory, appropriating the American language, imitating and internalizing American social habits, like smiling, makes them feel as if parts of America had taken possession of them, had become a part of them. In a similar but more explicit vein, in Cuba, many people, deities and spirits are part of everyday life. They are evoked, cared for, represented, paid homage to and incorporated in lively rites of possession. These take place mostly in the privacy of people's homes, where spiritual altars, shelves and other corners for the deities and the dead are carefully kept. In Havana, the two main African-inspired religious complexes are the West African-influenced Santeria, which translates to Cult of the Saints, a religion that worships the Yoruba Oricha gods, associated historically with the Catholic saints, namely through elaborate initiations, divination and celebratory ceremonies, and the Bantu Congo-inspired Palomonte ritual tradition that more closely deals with the spirits of the dead, and whose practitioners are known and feared for their effectiveness as sorcerers. Believers transit freely between the various interconnected ritual domains according to their needs and those of their spirits. Religion resolves, people constantly say. It can save a person in the next life, but in the here and now too. Indeed, the city's Afro-Cuban religious landscape is a veritable pragmatic marketplace of cosmic technologies. By transiting through it, the spiritual seeker is met with the means to heal her ailments, get to know her tutelary spirits and deities, acquire amulets and other protective objects, develop her skills as a medium and clairvoyant, be partly or fully initiated into a religious house where she will gain a new family, concoct witchcraft works that will promote her social and professional being, sometimes at the expense of others, and so on. In these Cuban contexts, selves are fluid, always in the process of transformation, resulting from ongoing interactions between various human and non-human actors. Self can no longer be thought in terms of a consistent unit, but as a kind of open-ended field in which it emerges through the continual plays, collaborations, affects, frictions and also intrigues of various intimate others. We could see the self here as a kind of theatre or stage, conceptually and politically bound and disciplined by cultural repertoires and plots, yet always at risk of erosion and even collapse. Contradiction thus often becomes a very dominant pattern marking the processes of formation and maintenance of self. In Kurumbin, a wildlife sanctuary in Queensland on the Australian Gold Coast, Wildlife keepers, animal displays, and human indigenous performers all evoke the idea of an indigenous Australian nature. The latter emerges as akin to imaginaries of the primordial wild nature located in the past of such settler societies as Australia that find in a specific conception of indigenous nature a metaphorical focus point. Through their discourses and displays, the indigenous people performing in the park position themselves in a contradictory mediating role between modern society and native nature. Many aspects of the performances claim an ancestral incorporation into the world of nature. In this sense, the indigenous human population is symbolically and ontologically assimilated to the realm of a pre-colonial native wilderness. To this extent, 
what many refer to as white and black Australia, hence appear to be kept in ontologically separate realms. The most stark contrast indicating a childlike black Australia with persistent magical or spiritual ties to the land, looked after by a modern paternalistic white nation state. For the performers, however, both ontologically distinct realms are part of the same reality. Despite their inherent contradictions, both constitute intimate others through which they make and maintain selves. What we learn from these very different cases and contexts is that to avoid dissipation and disappearance, and ultimately to maintain self in both a symbolic and material way, humans often cultivate relations with and to others. In so-called modern culture, the preservation and encounter with an elevated or even divinized nature, like that of Antarctica, is one specific case. In other cultures, different intimate others, places, people, objects and entities, help humans to ground and form selves. Most of the time, we try to make sure that these others are healthy, vigorous and happy. Maintaining a good relation to one's intimate others becomes a crucial concern for a successful social life. <laughs>